Good evening. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Carolyn No. I work for the Academy of Science. We're very pleased to be partners with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you conservation conversations. Many of you are Academy members and friends. For those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, I'd like to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are. The Academy is an independent science organization supported entirely through community contributions. We have been connecting science in the community since 1856 and have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. We offer a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, including the one tonight, collaborative science seminars, and free tri uh, trips and tours highlighting science at venues throughout the region. You can find out more information on, Academy, on the Academy and our community-wide events by visiting the website at www.academyofsciencestl.org. If you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there is an e-news sign-up sheet on the table in the back of the theater and some that will make their way around the audience this evening. If you are a student who needs to verify your attendance, please come see me after the talk. If you're interested in helping to support the Academy's many science opportunities for children and adults throughout the metro region, there are some membership brochures out on the table and you can also come talk to me after the event. I do want to mention one event that's going to be coming up soon. The Academy and Zoo also partner to bring you the long-running and po popular science seminar series on current and trending topics in science on Wednesday, April 3rd, here at the Zoo in the Living World Auditorium at 7.30 p.m. Dr. Gerald Hayes, Biologics Commercial Lead for Monsanto, will be here to talk about honeybee health and colony collapse disorder. The talk is free and open to the public. You do not need to register to attend. With that said, I'd like to introduce Zoo Education Director Louise Bradshaw, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Carolyn. And yes, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you all to the zoo this evening. Um, this is actually a really special topic for me and for all of us here at the St. Louis Zoo and an extremely special speaker that I'm introducing. Ingrid Porton has been at the zoo for 30 years five days, six hours, 12 minutes. Um, and, uh, and in coming to the zoo, Ingrid has been really one of the leaders for the St. Louis Zoo in making very substantial connections with our conservation partners all around the world, and particularly in the what seems to many of us here in the States a very unknown and sort of mysterious and magical place, Madagascar. Um, Ingrid will, will be sharing with us you know, some of that mystery, some of that magic, and some of the challenges and her amazing accomplishments there in Madagascar and working with the people there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ingrid. Thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of a walker, so um, um, I may be pacing the stage a bit. Um, what I want to talk about, of course, is Madagascar and um, tell you about our programs there and um, also some of the real challenges that we face in Madagascar. Some of them, of course, are common to all areas and then some are a little bit special to Madagascar. So um, I'm going to start by just trying to orient you to what we are doing in Madagascar and who we are. Um, so you'll see me or you'll hear me talking about the MFG, the Madagascar Fauna Group. Um, and at the Madagascar Fauna Group, which is now the Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group, but still MFG, um, began in 1988, and we were a founding member. And basically what it was was a number of international zoos that paid dues into um, a pot for doing in situ, so in-country conservation in Madagascar. So um, we've been doing or contributing to work in Madagascar for an awfully long time. Um, <clears throat> In 2004, when Dr. Bonner got here, um, he uh, wanted 
uh, the zoo to concentrate on just a few projects, uh, uh, fewer than what we were before. And so he developed, um, and actually with uh, Dr. Eric Miller, the Wild Care Institute. And um, so under the Wild Care Institute, my center was the Madagascar Center. Um, but the Madagascar Center really works through the Madagascar Fauna Group because the Madagascar Fauna Group has all the connections um, with the government officials. Um, and of course, we have infrastructure there. And you have to be on the ground to be able to know what projects need to be done and how to do them. You can't do them from St. Louis. Um, in 2004, the headquarters of the Madagascar Fauna Group moved to St. Louis. Um, Eric Miller is chair of it, and I am vice chair. So that's just to try and orient you. Um, so the MFG and the Lemur, uh, excuse me, the Madagascar Center, um, basically we take four approaches to conservation. And um, they're not always distinct because they kind of blend into each other. But just for clarity, um, our four pillars are education, capacity building, research, and conservation action. We work in two areas. One is Batampun Natural Reserve. Um, so here we're in Tomasina, so Madagascar is the fourth largest island in the world. Um, very diverse habitats down here. It looks like Arizona, and up here it's tropical forest. So we work in Tomasina, and particularly we work in Batampun Natural Reserve, which is a 2,228 hectare lowland rainforest. Um, and we have a station outside of there, and we have um, a team. Um, within Madagascar, we have an expat, um, now an American uh, program manager, and then we have a staff of about 40 Malagasy, so we are providing jobs as well as training and education with them. Our other side is Park Ivaluina, and people get a little bit confused about that. It's not a national park or anything like that. It's a former forestry station. It's on just under three, 300 hectares. Um, and a lot of it is exotic um, trees because it was used as a forestry station to see what exotic trees would do well in Madagascar and could be planted for different uses. Um, since we have been involved, there was a little zoo there uh, that was basically confiscated animals. And so over time, that's been transformed into a very lovely zoo that we run, all endemic animals. But on the property, um, we use that basically for a training center. It's an incredible opportunity. We now have a training center, and the grounds can be used as in-the-field practice um, and a lot of other things. But I don't have time to tell you all of that. So um, I want to tell you about some of the projects that we are involved in. We are a big program, um, relatively, uh, certainly no world wildlife. Um, but we have a overarching program and within that projects. So I want to talk about three of our research projects just to give you a taste of the type of things that we're doing in Madagascar. Um, as many probably know, slash and burn agriculture is one of the biggest problems that we face in Madagascar. Um, it's an old traditional farming method. It works just fine if there aren't a lot of people, but once you get a lot of people, it doesn't work at all. Um, and of course, when you burn the land and it's fertile for um, a couple of years, and then all the fertility has been used up, and then the people need to go to the next place. Traditionally, you know, then the plants would grow up, you'd burn it down again, and everything would be fine. Um, but we're losing immense amount of land um, in Madagascar as a result of slash and burn. So we really need to do something to prevent the need for slash and burn. Um, so we've worked, we have developed a partnership with Dr. Christoph den Bichelar. Um, he is a specialist in eco-agriculture, um, and he has come in, he has a very good 
method of working um, in this field. He doesn't come in and say, I am you know, from a developed country and I know how to do everything and this is what she'll do. Um, obviously, the best way to do things is to listen to the farmers, what works, what doesn't work. They have the most knowledge of their land. And then he can incorporate um, certain activities, methods that can help improve their um, production, and that's our goal. One of the things that I find pretty amazing is that the Malagasy really don't produce compost. Um, and yet compost can make a world of difference um, to the soil and their ability to continue using the same land piece. So he has worked with the farmers to um, start them using compost. In addition, at Eva Luina, um, we are doing research, or he's doing research with our team on the materials that make the best compost. So we have, um, a lab that can do analysis of soil, so you can then go and see, okay, if you need this kind of soil, um, we need to use these materials, et cetera. So trying to put a science on it. Um, and here you can see, uh, so here is making uh, compost and working with the farmers. Um, so, he, trans he actually spent a six-month sabbatical um, to work with us in 2007 to get the program going. And then, of course, he passed on. He taught some of our staff um, how to further the program. And so Christian, I love Christian, um, he's very enthusiastic, and he is the manager of our eco-agriculture program. So he's continuing the research at Eva Luina and also helping um, doing training or demonstrations, talking to students that come in. Um, and this area, it's, if you remember seeing Eva Luina, there was a lot of scrub stuff and, and some nasty ferns and that. Um, so he's working just, it's a lot of manual label, labor to try and turn this over to productive um, farm, uh, crops and what crops work there because one of the other things that we want to do is um, have farmers grow a greater variety of crops. Um, it's common, I mean it's a common practice in many places um, that if one crop doesn't work you need to fall back on another. Um, and also it's better for the soil if you use different crops. So. Um, he was incredibly proud of the oranges. So he's, after several years, he's really starting to produce um, the crops and do well with them. And on top of that, one of our goals was that he produce enough that we don't have to buy food for the lemurs and the other animals at the zoo. So um, kind of helps us out too. But ultimately what you want to do is you want to transfer it over to the farmers and get more farmers to start using these techniques. Um, it can be a difficult um, process and to figure out exactly how to do it. We used to have workshops, bring farmers in, give them training, and then send them back out. Um, but we found that this was not very effective. So now what he's doing is he's working with a limited number of farmers and doing much more intensive training. So working with them, going back on a weekly basis or um, every two weeks or so to see how they're doing, answer questions, help problem solve. With the goal that, this is one of the goals, is that you can make money off of it, you can help feed your family, etc. So this was really a big day. Um, this is a market. <laughs> um, and so this is one of the families that has lots of good produce that they're able to sell. And the idea is we get other people coming and seeing their accomplishments and hopefully it starts to catch on. It can be a slow process, but such is life. Um, and this was kind of wonderful to see too. That's Batam Poon up there. And you see some of the people already um, developing compost piles, so that's um, nice. One of the other problems that we have in Batampoon is invasive plants. I'm sure many of you are aware of some of the problems we have with invasives in Missouri. Um, and in fact, invasives, both animals and plants, are the second greatest 
threat to um, endangered species. So they come in, they take over, and um, the species, the endemic species, um, loses out. Um, our research director, when she first came to Batam Poon, she'd worked in Mauritius before. Mauritius had a huge problem with guava. And by golly, there she saw guava, and she realized how horrible it is. It really takes over. And so she had Malagasy students. These are master's students, and we work a lot with them. <clears throat> she had them uh, start to map out um, where the invasive, invasives were and how much space they were taking in Batampoon. And it was um, discouraging to hear the results. They're really going in. And um, another researcher who was studying the white-fronted lemurs, um, you know, very nicely they do their seed dispersing job. This is what they're supposed to do in the wild. They just pick the wrong crop. But they love guava, so they go in, they get the guava, and they go back into the forest and they plant it in its own little fertilizer package. So um, that was phase one of our um, research on invasives. Um, phase two was to see, OK, how are we going to control it? Um, and uh, Lala, you see there, um, he was one of our employees. He's a great guy. He really wanted a PhD. And we were then able, through Wild Care, we're funding his PhD. And his research is on non-chemical uh, ways to remove guava, to try and control it, if we can eliminate it even better. So um, his research looked at four different ways um, to do it. These are all manual. So one of them <laughs> um, is removing them by the roots. And I have a series of pictures of them. And they got chains, and they got guys you know, sweating and pulling. There's no truck that goes up there that you can do it the way we do. Um, so it's a lot of work. And it also can damage the soil area around it. So um, all the little micro habitats around those roots can get disturbed. Um, another way was just to coppice. Um, so I never thought that would work. I mean, you know, you coppice and then it's great. They just grow even bushier when you're done. Um, and a third way um, was to strip the bark for a certain um, percentage of the, of the plant. And then the fourth was to do this, but plant natives afterwards. And so when um, I was there in November, um, it was very exciting because he's been collecting the data. This has been going on for a while. And it's pretty amazing that the coppicing um, actually is showing some success. So he still has to tabulate everything. But what they do is they don't do it just once. So they go and they coppice it. And then um, if they see any leaves or, or anything, uh, they pick them off. And then they'll do it again. So after a few times, it seems to be working. The plant kind of dies. Um, but the best way to do that um, was to then uh, plant um, natives along with it. So um, uh, this may be a way that we can try and control it. And um, my fingers are really crossed. Um, I think those of you who have followed the problems in conservation, um, habitat loss is, of course, the biggest reason for um, animals being threatened with extinction. But along with that is habitat fragmentation. Um, and the fragmentation is a killer. Um, so we have Batampoon sitting there all by itself. It used to be part of light. It used to be part of um, a contiguous forest, rainforest all up and down the East Coast. But um, as more and more of the forest was cut down, um, you have fragments of rainforest. So Batampoon's 
closest um, forest is Zahamena, and it's much too far to really be able to do a corridor or anything. So um, fragmentation is a huge problem. Um, here you can see again um, an image of Batampun and um, on this, the satellite image, and this one, um, we're working with St. Louis University, Dr. Wasit Wuluma, who is developing our database and doing um, remote sensing work so that we can track um, changes in Batampun. But at any rate, you can see all around it is farmed land or degraded land. I mean, there's nowhere for the animals to go. And this is kind of um, the type of habitat that you would see around it. And lemurs are great jumpers, but <laughs> they're not going to go on the ground for miles and miles. It's a great way to kill yourself. Um, so, you know, love can't happen with someone new and exciting to you. Um, so. That's one of the big problems with fragmented habitats, is that um, populations, this is all about small population biology and the problems that uh, come along with it. So what can we do? Um, we've been working on a lemur conservation um, plan, looking at, OK, what can we do um, to help improve the um, viability of the populations of lemurs in Batampun. We have 11 different lemur species. Five of them are diurnal. We have been concentrating on four of the diurnal species. Indri, uh, diadem shafak, black and white rough lemur, and white fronted brown lemurs. Um, so these are diadema, an incredibly gorgeous animal. Um, so what we are looking at is to do translocations. Well, what do you do? Um, basically, you know, you um, work with others to develop a plan of where you can take some animals from one area and move them to another. So, um, you know, you could see that one up there with four little diadema. Not really, but as an example. Um, so take some animals from here and put them over there. And so you can increase genetic diversity um, of the population and hopefully keep that population going. I think one thing that's important to remember that even though Batampun is a relatively small reserve, those animals in it, so those populations of lemurs should not be looked at, oh, they're small populations, so we should just get rid of them. Um, they don't matter, you know, we won't work to save them. But every time you have isolated populations, you have certain genes that become fixed in those populations. And those genes are all important, so you need to continue um, to um, keep those genes in the population by moving animals um, in between. So this whole um, idea of metapopulation management. Um, so what about, we're at a zoo, you ask, well, lots of people love the idea of reintroducing captive-born animals. Um, and that is a potential. Um, so indeed, if you're looking at metapopulation management, moving animals from one population to another, the zoo is considered one population. But um, you I think you need to look at that as a fallback population for a number of reasons. Um, you may also be familiar, I know some of you who've been here for a long time and know that the MFG did the first ever, and so far only, reintroduction of captive-born um, lemurs, and in this case they were rough lemurs. Um, Indri and Diadema Shafak are not in captivity, so we couldn't do it um, regardless. But in 1997, we began a reintroduction um, over a period of three years with 13 rough lemurs, so three different introductions. Um, and I'm just going to give you some quick results from that. Um, what was the goal? The goal was that they survive for a period of time so that we know that they could adapt to the environment. 
And the other one, of course, is that they breed so that they're infusing new genes into the population. So the first group was a group from Duke Lemur Center. They were already together and they had already had experience roaming in Duke's free ranging areas. So they'll have areas that are nine hectares or seven hectares. Um, so one of our requirements was that we selected candidates, I'm the SSP coordinators, so selected a range of candidates, potential. They had to go through uh, medical evaluations to see if they were healthy or they could p possibly transfer any diseases. And then they had to go to boot camp. Well, the first candidates were already in boot camp, so that was very nice. Um, so these are the five that were released, and what you see is the number of months that they survived in the wild. Um, Sarf was our hero. Um, he actually, we didn't find him for a year, but then we refound him, um, and he lived in the wild um, for the longest time until the new winter. Um, but you see that Letitia and Janice died relatively early, uh, one from a fall, and I think the other potentially from a FUSA. Um, there's the FUSA, uh, cool animal. So we have a threatened animal eating an endangered animal, and you know, what are you gonna do? Life, that's life. Um, in the 1998 release, there were four animals, and that, that was the worst group. Um, unfortunately, three of them succumbed to FUSA, and when, um, when Barney left, then you can see Barney at 23 months was, um, was killed by Fusa, and then we took Dawn, who was the sole surviving um, lemur of that group. And they spent too much time on the ground, they spent too much time at the release area, they just never really adapted. So Dawn was actually taken to Eva Luina Zoo, where she lived a long and happy life, um, and actually just died a year or so ago. Um, so then the third release group did pretty darn well. Um, so it was a mom, Hale, and her three sons. And as you can see, these two are still alive, so they're our champions now. Um, and um, Quintana uh, died, but Hale um, bred with a wild male. That's what you want. Um, so she bred with a wild male and um, gave birth to a male and female offspring that are still alive as far as we know. Um, and um, the problem with males, you know, it's a female who gives birth, you know she did. Uh, with males, we've seen all those males, Sarf and the other two, with females that have young, but you know, we don't quite know who the daddy is. Um, so that's why we need um, DNA to help us sort that out. Um, so I would look at this as a relative success. And the number of animals that we put out there, the number that lived for over two years, and then also the number that um, reproduced. Um, so what do we need to know to do translocations? Because if this is our plan, then we need to do a number of things to be ready for it. So these are the four species that um, I just mentioned. Um, and you can see that three are critically endangered. So listed now as critically endangered. And this guy was just upgraded to endangered. So one of the things that we need to do is if we're releasing animals to the wild, we need to do health surveys, um, so with the reintroduction. Um, but we also need to do that if we're doing translocations. But health surveys benefit us in a number of ways. Um, first of all, they allow us to understand, start to get data when you have a large enough database on what are normals, and also then be able to identify by um, look at different habitat types um, or different habitats that are, have different levels of disturbance and see if that's impacting the health status of the animals. It may be, there may be other things involved too. Um, 
So um, also, if there's a captive population, then we can start to understand more the normals in the wild, again, when we build up a large enough sample size. Um, and health surveys may serve as a quick, once we understand what the values mean, they may serve as a quick evaluation of how this habitat is doing. Um, so it can help us really um, prioritize different habitats or different populations. Um, and of course then, if we're going to translocate animals, we need to know, are there any diseases and problems within the population that we're moving animals into, and are the animals bringing any um, disease problems with them? So that's one thing. Another thing is that we really need to understand better the ecology, especially feeding ecology and habitat use by the species. So is there enough good habitat to increase the population? Maybe they're at max, maybe they're at carrying capacity. Um, so, uh, and are the species competing with each other? Um, so maybe one of the species is, um, the population isn't very viable, it's a small population, we find that it's inbred, and so we want to, um, to boost that population's viability, but is there enough habitat for that population to grow? Um, and our most recent <laughs> visit in November to Batam Poon, I saw more uh, white-fronted brown lemurs, just call them albifrons, um, than I had in the years past. I think they are really doing well in the tampoon. And of course, they have a diet that overlaps some of the others. So um, we want students to be doing research on that. That's Emily Mertz on the top. Um, she was a intern here. Um, and she went on to work with us in the tampoon and is now Dr. Mertz. Um, and this is Lana uh, Kirker. She was also an intern with us and then a part-timer with us and now she's doing her PhD in Batampoon. So we are capacity building some of the local St. Louisans as well. Um, but both of them looked at um, habitat use and feeding ecology of Indri and Propothecus diadema. So obviously, I mean, this is a very silly representation of genetic diversity, but um, one of our goals is that we need to know what the genetic diversity is within the populations that are there, so each individual population, um, because genetic diversity goes down, you're more susceptible to diseases, et cetera. The populations are clearly too small to be sustaining over time. I mean, we know that. Um, but we also need to get a handle on it so that we can evaluate, too, what we're doing. Um, so it's important whenever you're doing something like this to make the most use out of the work that you're doing, and that is following it, evaluating it, and be able to transfer that information along. Um, so family sizes, if we have unequal family sizes, that's going to be a problem. And we know all about that in zoos. That's one of the things we do a lot, a lot of work with. OK, so this past November, um, Dr. Sharon Deem, who I saw somewhere in there, um, and I and Feedy, a Malagasy veterinarian, went to Batampoon to do a health evaluation, also then getting blood samples for genetic work, as well as putting radio collars or color collars on the individuals for our own team so they can track them, but also for the PhD students that are working there. So um, this is Sharon. Um, she's great in the field. She's like a Malagasy running up and down those steep slopes, which really ticked me off because I can't. Um, and uh, a great shot, and then once the animal is shot, um, then our team surrounds the tree and hopefully gets the animal as it tumbles down. We actually have one stay up in the tree. And you know this Malagasy just whip on up that tree um, and kind of pushed him off. And then uh, you can never get a good look at how steep the slopes are, but that's steep. 
Um, so running up there and getting that animal to the area that we set up for doing the exams. And so um, we had three Malagasy students with us as well. Um, and uh, up that in that corner, um, Katrina Karina was a, um, actually she graduated from that school. Um, so she helped prepare everything and of course help with the exams. There's Feedy. Um, so the vets do a complete physical exam and then also collect blood of course, um, look for parasites. Um, there's a tick that seems to really like the nostrils of the poor diadema. Um, we only saw that on one Varicia, but diadema it's much more common and we don't know why. Um, and I just love this picture because if you've watched our Shafak, um, obviously we have a different species, but the males have a scent gland there and they luxuriously rub up against things. And this guy really went to town. You can see how stained his scent gland is. Um, and this also shows the um, radio collar that we put on him. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's a hell of a job, excuse me, um, but somebody has to hold them when they're waking up. So that was probably one of the greatest experiences in my life to hold critically endangered Indri and diadema. Um, and then once they really start waking up and moving them around, um, we can put them in a sack and then hang them from a tree <laughs> and then wait for them to recover uh, further. Then let them out from their little sack. Um, we let them out uh, close to where they were captured and then we watch them to see if they're stable and how they're doing and jumping okay. Um, and I'm happy to say that our, all our animals were fine. Um, so those are some of the research projects we're doing. What about capacity building? Um, in 2005, Wild Care sponsored a um, workshop where we brought Malagasy over. Um, so this, at the time, Madagascar had presidents of provinces, and Emil uh, was president of the province of Tamatov. Then we had the head of the, um, uh, it was at that time, ANGAP, um, and we had Professor Ustash um, and uh, another woman from the um, Tourist Bureau. And we had our education um, manager. Um, so they all came and we then assembled people from local universities. And the idea was we were looking, asking the Malagasy, what kind of caring capacity needs did they really have? This was a time when the then president um, said he wanted to increase the parks, um, the number of parks dramatically. Um, and they simply didn't have enough people that were educated natural resource managers. So there was a real need to have more training. So when that was decided, okay, then um, how and what are your needs? So uh, Jean Garrett from the University of Missouri, Columbia, who was um, agroforester, um, Emil loved him. Um, also partially because Gene's a great guy, um, but also because he had the skills that were really needed. And Emil said, if biodiversity will win, poverty must lose. And there's just no doubt about it. Um, you have to deal with poverty if you're going to do conservation. And I can tell you, as much as I love animals and as much as I want to work with them, conservation is people. It's all people. Um, so it was Jean who brought in Christoph because Christoph had experience with tropical eco-agriculture, whereas Jean did not. Um, one of the other things that came out of that meeting, or that actually helped spur the meeting, was um, the building of a training center. Um, and I'm proud to say that Wild Care um, actually paid for most of it. But it started out with a classroom and a lab. There were no lab facilities, so um, we added those. Um, then added a dormitory, and just two years ago, um, we added the kitchen dining area. So the idea was that the Malagasy, it's hard for them to 
um, get transportation to go, so they can't just come to the training center and go home. So a dormitory would allow extended workshops and also be good for colleagues that are from further away. Um, and then we could provide more training. And um, the, the uh, park evoluene, so we have all, we do have different habitat types, and those are great also for training students because one of the things that students told us is in the French way, they got a lot of book learning and a lot of classroom time, but they never got out into the field um, to actually use some of the methods they'd been taught. So once they got into a job, they had no idea how to do it. So this was also, um, it made the Park Evoluene actually ideal for this work. So they can do censuses here. You see they're being trained by a SLU student um, to do um, fish captures and identification. Eek. Okay, capacity building here. Um, I already told you about Lala. He is getting his PhD. So our capacity building is institutional um, as well as individual. So um, Lala's getting his PhD. Um, this is Fidi who got his DVM and then came to the States to get additional training. He's now in um, Canada doing his master's and we hope, if anybody has any influence in there, use it. Um, we'll get into a PhD program at UMSL. Um, and above, there's Sharon with one of the students that came with us, and I'm hoping she was interested in a PhD, and I'm hoping that, and she's interested in, doing her PhD on comparing albifrons and varicia, and then we would pay for her PhD. Um, and then Fidi with the other vet student, and down below, Beza, um, he was a master's student. We get a lot of them that come through. He did an inventory on the bats at Evaluina, so um, it's nice for us. We get good information, and it's nice for them. They get good um, training. Um, conservation action is another one of our pillars, um, and we're also involved with certain projects that uh, move forward, we hope, conservation. One of the problems around the Tampoon is there was supposed to be a zone of protection. Basically, that is an area, um, so if you understand the edge effect, um, we want to try and protect the interior of the forest. And so the edge effect is basically the edge of a forest gets pounded by um, all the different elements and stuff, and so um, it starts shrinking back and back. So if you have a zone of protection and you can keep that up, you can protect the actual forest. Um, so uh, th our objective was to replant the zone of protection, um, but of course that started with talks, um, going around and talking to, we have nine villages surrounding Batampoon, so it's going, talking, and meeting with the people, what um, kind of things would they like to see, and especially what we were looking at is we wanted to have some of the natives planted around the zone, but then also trees that they could use, and also trees that they could put in their community areas um, for their use. So um, we worked out arrangements and um, came up with a plan that uh, they liked and we liked, and then started the work. It's clearing, um, this is just junk vegetation, and we set up nurseries. So we trained um, some of the villagers to run the nursery and then gave them seeds for both um, the non-endangered tree species as well as other species that they were interested in. And they're responsible for growing them and they've been doing a terrific job. Um, and then starting to plant them out. Um, and of course this process is gonna take a long time, many years. Um, but you can see on our map the green areas are where um, we have uh, where plantings have occurred, so we'll keep, um, keep monitoring that. 
Um, MBG, Missouri Botanical Gardens, as I like to say, is better known in Madagascar than it is in Missouri. It's a big deal in Madagascar. They do an awful lot of work there um, and have been responsible for identifying a lot of the plant species um, in Madagascar. There's some other, of course, um, botanical gardens and researchers that work there, but MBG's big, um, and they have an office in Madagascar, but I'm happy to say they feel strongly enough about the Madagascar, and we added flora for them, Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group, um, that they are a member of the MFG. Um, so Chris, the guy in the middle there, um, Birkinshaw is a PhD, and he manages the research program. And one of the projects that we have done together, so our research director, um, along with some input from me and Chris, put together a National Geographic proposal to develop a nursery to propagate uh, some of the most endangered tree species on the East Coast. So the idea is basically it's a breeding center for endangered plants. And Evelyn is very well suited to do that. We already had our guys working on nurseries um, for you know our agriculture projects and everything. So they're experienced. Um, so Mobot, what they did is they sent out their teams to collect seeds from endangered trees. And so they had a number that they identified as we want to get those. They couldn't find them all, and in some cases, you go out, you know, and you didn't come at the breeding season, um, so it takes some time to get them all, but um, they did collect seeds, then they bring them back, um, sort them out, and store them, and all that, um, and it was nice to have Christoph there, an ag person, because he also gave some hints on ways to uh, improve germination rates. So you can try different things. You know, you can boil them in water. I learned all sorts of fun things um, to kind of mimic the digestive system of an animal who helps a seed <laughs> um, uh, germinate. So um, that project is going on and has been expanded. It's been pretty successful so far. Um, some of the trees get planted out at Evaluina. Others go to communities. So it may be the, um, the school at the community. So we plant some endangered plants and they take care of it. They have some pride with that. Um, and it's great for um, hopefully uh, being a life jacket for those species. Okay, so challenging times. So I just wanted to give you a taste of some of the projects that we're doing and that we're involved in. Uh, but by golly, Madagascar, um, it's hard. It's a tough place. Um, the population, when I began there, it was 11 million in 91, and it's doubled. And I can see it so clearly. I mean, everything. Um, there's just so many people everywhere. Things are crowded. Um, and you can see the population growth rate at 2.95 um, is one of the highest of the countries for which they have um, stats. So out of 230 countries, Madagascar's is the 13th highest population growth rate. Um, here you have average number of babies per woman, 4.96, so five-ish. Um, and maternal mortality, still way too high. Um, you can see that. And um, infant mortality, also high, although it has been dropping. Um, and literacy rate is still much too low. Um, so that presents all sorts of challenges to do conservation. Um, but what I want to do now is give you a little bit of political history because it's the politics right now that has made Madagascar even more of a mess, and a mess it is. Um, so Madagascar was a French colony. In 1960, they were liberated from the French, and they elected a president. Um, then that president um, stepped down and gave his power over to his general. Um, then after a coup, then we get uh, Ratsirika, and he holds power for a long, long time. Um, in 
when I was there in 1991, I came to Tana, which is the t capital, a short, short, uh, shortened name for the capital on Tanana Rivo. Um, when I got there, there were protests, so there were people protesting in the street. So I got there just at an exciting time. Um, so uh, in 92, after those protests, um, Ratsirak um, developed a new, more democratic reforms. It was much more of a socialist government, and he ruled it with a tight hand. Um, and then in 93, uh, Albert Zafi became president. Um, he remained president for a few years, but he was a pretty weak president. And then um, Ratsirika took over again. Um, and, you know, the economic slide back. So uh, then we get to two t 2002, where Mark Ravalamanana ran again, against um, the president and won, but it was disputed um, because, you know, this is one of these elections where you might go a um, couple of times if there's no clear winner. But in this case, uh, Ravala Manana said there's a clear winner. He won 51%. Uh, Rat Siraka didn't want to give up power. And I remember then, too, um, there were blockades all over Madagascar. You couldn't go into Tamatav, which is where we are. Um, so it was a mess for about six months until it was finally settled. And then Mark became the president. And Ratsirika went into exile into France. France still maintained a lot of ties and still does. Um, so the little jockey's coming up next. But um, so in 2006, he wins re-election. And in 2009, really, the problems start. So there's protests in the streets. And um, one of, so you start reading in more detail, you know, Mark um, uh, Ravalamananan did a lot of good things for Madagascar. Madagascar was really starting to prosper. He increased the um, acreage of protected areas, but there were also some funny things going on. Um, and probably the um, straw that broke the camel's back was this Daywood Logistics Company from South Korea, and he worked out that they'd get a 99-year lease um, to take over 1.3 million hectares of arable land in Madagascar. Um, unbelievable. And this is for producing corn and maize for their people and biofuels. And in the meantime, the Malagasy are dirt poor and are hungry. Um, so unfortunately, um, there were riots and eventually uh, some much more serious stuff where there were injuries. Malagasy, you really don't have any violent, a lot of violent um, acts there, but this time a lot of people were killed and shot. Um, and then there was vying for power, and eventually the military that wasn't taking sides finally took sides with, um, I don't know why his picture isn't coming up, too bad. He looks like a kid. Um, uh, he was the, um, Andre Joselina was the uh, Rajolina was the mayor of Tana, um, and he was much too young to be president. You have to be 40, and he was 30. Um, but the military backed him, and then um, eventually Mark Ravalamanana had to go into exile because there were lots of threats, and then. Um, then Andre set up that he was head of the High Transitional Authority. So this was supposedly a transitional government. Well, by golly, that trans, there he is, see? Um, so, yeah. Um, so uh, what happened is that because it was not a democratic process, and there were no elections coming up. Um, the big donors, the US pulled out, Europe pulled out, 
Um, and so a lot of the aid that Madagascar depends on was removed. What happened? The country just got more and more um, poor. Um, so the Africans have tried to set, uh, uh, go in and negotiate with the Malagasy and the South African development community has really taken the largest role and for several years have been trying to do this and for several years um, Andre puts them off. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll do that, yeah, yeah. And then there's another reason why it doesn't happen. So this is four years later and we still don't have um, a sanctioned government. Now he says there will be elections in May and I am not holding my breath. Um, but this has been a huge and significant uh, detriment to Madagascar. So Madagascar was starting to climb up a little bit and now it's sunk back down. You can see um, Wall Street Journal, aren't we pleased? Now we're in the top 10 of the poorest countries in the world. Um, some of it, of course, government dysfunction, and we feel it in our work. I mean, paperwork is a nightmare in Madagascar, but it's even more of a nightmare when people are changing and, you know, there's corruption and et cetera. And we don't do bribes, so we have to do everything the right way, and um, it can be a nightmare. Uh, poverty, you can see, is really high. Um, U.S. State Department figures right now, you can see when Ravala Manana was in, you see that it, the economy was growing 5 to 7 percent on average, and now it's, it's really sunk down. So um, it's hardly growing at all, and the people are just getting more and more and more poor. Um, education has become a huge problem. Um, first of all, um, Madagascar needed to improve its educational system, which was one thing that Mark, the former president, was doing and was having some success with. But now the budget is just slashed. Um, nothing compared to, I mean, much more compared than what we're threatening in the U.S. I mean slash and burn budgeting. Um, so basically money was taken away from the school programs. Um, they used to pay for primary school for the children. Now they don't. The parents can't afford the fees, which are, you know, minuscule, but they can't afford them. Um, the teachers, it's, it's a joke. Um, Two-thirds of the teacher are actually just volunteers who have not been trained as teachers. Um, and, you know, sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come. You never quite know what's going on. Um, so education has gone backwards. Um, and the poverty levels. Um, so here you can see on the way to um, our zoo, you know, the whole road down there, you see villagers who are just cracking rocks to make gravel. Um, and it can be a dangerous job, you know, we've got eye injuries and that kind of thing. Also a problem in Madagascar is child labor. So many, many children are being used for child labor and not just on the farms, um, but you can see here helping to um, break up rocks. Um, harm to children, um, children going into um, the sex trade. Um, everything is up uh, in sweatshops. It's, it's bad. Um, and it's hard to do conservation then. Um, Madagascar still does um, prioritize conservation, but of course it's difficult. Um, you can't work with a team that's hungry and has all sorts of personal problems. Um, the complete lawlessness that is, is rampant right now, um, there is no stable government, there are no, there is no plan. So Ravala Manana had the map, Madagascar Action Plan had, uh, you know, the different segments, activities of the government planned out. There's nothing now. Um, and uh, resource extraction is just free willy-nilly. Um, and the biggest problems, I don't know if you heard about it, but um, Meshwal is the largest park in Madagascar, and people just went in there and took out all, or lots, tons and tons of rosewood and ebony. 
Um, so both of, they're endangered plant species, of course, it's in a national park, which you're not allowed to go in, and you just see them freely going in. So there's lots of corruption involved, um, and there's lots of terror involved, because if you try and go against them, these guys have guns, and they go after you. Um, so I heard one story of a lawyer who was really trying to help, and so he was gunned down. Um, agents have been gunned down. So, um, you know, this is big business, and they're going to shoot you for it. Um, so you can see the amount of money that's earned from these. Uh, some of it went back to the government, which is how Rajalina was able to pay staff in the government. Um, and so um, along with uh, taking out the trees, um, and here you can see again, um, so they set up stations there, and you know, they cut and sometimes um, make the, the wood into nice um, logs. But they take them right down the river, and we saw it too, down the Ivaluina River. They're taking, got uh, hardwoods from somewhere further up, and then they're just taking them down. And you go to the authorities, and there's not much that they do. Um, and I don't know if any of you heard about Gibson guitar. Um, but Gibson, they have always used the ebony and rosewood from Madagascar, loved it, you know. Um, and then the Lacey Act added on to it not just protection for animals, but also protection for endangered trees. And um, of course, the, uh, Gibson wasn't supposed to go in and um, get uh, by hardwood from Madagascar, but they did, but they said, oh no, they thought it was legal, blah, blah, blah. Um, so this took several years, but um, Gibson Guitar did have to pay a fee. They are a small part of the market, very small, but of course we had Republican senators who proposed to strip that part of the Lacey Act, which thank heavens wasn't approved, um, but you know, Conservation, you try and do conservation, and business interests and personal wealth and everything get in the way, and that's true for Madagascar, that's true for the U.S., that's true for all of us. Unfortunately, you know, our needs sometimes go above conservation, and it's something we all have to think about. Um, so, uh, we also were, were small. Um, 2,228 hectares, um, and we have a presence in the forest because our agents go out, we have researchers out there, and that always helps control people coming in illegally. But during this time, you can see our figures there, the number of infractions went up um, when the, after the coup. Um, and what we had to do, you can see the drop in 2011, is we had to hire more villagers to patrol the forest. And um, here you see we had uh, one of those night cameras and then we saw some people who were going illegally into the forest. And here we're mapping where the violations are so our team will um, take a GPS reading and then we try and map it and keep records for um, the managing authority. Sorry, I have to show this. Um, it's not something pleasant to look at, but it's something that you have to look at. Along with um, taking down the trees, you got big groups in there and they need to eat, so they kill lemurs. Um, and other bushmeat as well. Up there, flying foxes. Here you see lemurs. Um, so lemurs are bushmeat um, for you know, the laborers that go in, but also regularly consumed by villagers. We are now working with a um, professor from Harvard, Dr. Um, Chris Golden, who did his PhD, some remarkable research, looking at Makira and the level of bushmeat that is used by Malagasy, and it was much higher than what people had thought before. Um, so Makira is another large area, and he spoke Malagasy, he worked with a team, and he gained their trust, and he really got a good handle on the extent of the bushmeat. Um, so that, of course, is a problem to conservation, but he's also looking at it from a human point of view, 
um, and he has done more research and calculations looking at the amount of bushmeat that is meat eaten in a family and with kids and what the health consequences would be of removing that bushmeat. And it's significant. Um, so this is a significant source of protein for a country where many, many people are not only hungry but severely malnourished. Um, and so if you want to do conservation, you have to find solutions for that. Um, so actually, we helped fund a um, initial work um, with a vet, uh, Dr. Graham Crawford, who uh, teamed up with Chris Golden and some other people to look at the problem of raising chickens in Makira. Because chickens, you see chickens everywhere in Madagascar. But as it turns out, production is really not very good because the chickens in Makira periodically have massive deaths. And it seems that it's Newcastle disease. OK, so if we can solve that problem, then maybe we can increase chicken production and decrease bushmeat. Um, so they're looking at a vaccine for Newcastle's disease that um, would be inexpensive and could be manufactured in Madagascar. So that's where that project is going now. Um, and Chris Golden um, is now working with us in Batampoon. He's got a team there that are doing the same kind of surveys, looking at how much bushmeat occurs or is used in our area. Now, we've done some of these studies with master's students, but this is going to be a very thorough study and also be comparable to what he has done. He just emailed me that the team has done some interviews um, with the closest villages, and the good news is that there's not a lot of bushmeat use. So um, we'll see. We know that we have gone in, um, and like I said, our team does patrols. And one of the ways, I mean, there's not a lot of guns that are used in some areas. There are, but a lot of these are snare traps. So they put out traps and um, catch the lemurs that way. They go into a noose and eventually die or get clubbed when the people find them. Um, that's an Avahi up there. Um, so our rates aren't high, but they still impacted us. Um, but we were much better able to control it because we're small. The other impact also is that at our zoo, we get a lot more animals come in. And this is a result partially of the bushmeat trade, but also because lemurs are sometimes captured as infants and then sold um, as pets. Um, and we've seen um, an increase with Varicia, um, critically endangered species, as well as some of the nocturnals and others. And um, at Ivaluina, we are a confiscation area, so the government brings us the animals, and we have to find the room for them. Um, I wanted to share this because um, this just came out recently, and I think it is it gratifies me because it's really how I feel. We have to have a smart public. We all have to be smart. We have to be able to question things. We have to be able to examine issues. We have to be able to look at confounding factors and decide how you approach a problem. Um, with an ignorant populace, um, conservation is not going to um, be very successful. And this study was done looking at elephants and looking at the different countries that have elephant populations and comparing um, good and bad populations with the levels of education and the governance of the um, country. Some of those really important factors, and then you notice you know, I'm talking about governance. Madagascar right now is horrible. I'm talking about poverty. Madagascar is desperate. Um, I'm talking about education. Education is going down. Um, so really, 
Um, it's not only important for the Malagasy folks, it's important for us because we live in a very global world. And it's the Chinese going in to buy the rosewood so they can have million dollar beds. It's a global economy. What you want, what I want, impacts conservation. Everything, and you know, my lasting, <laughs> everything you do in your life is conservation. Because you get people, how can I help lemurs? How can I do this? Everything in your life is conservation. Who you vote for, uh, how you raise your family, what kind of values you instill, everything is conservation. So, to try and kind of capture that, um, I'm fiddling around with this, but you know, here's conservation. So what people really want to help with is the species management, the land management, the cool stuff. You know, that's what I love too. But guess what? It's all the stuff above. It's capacity building. We have to improve education, improve livelihoods. We need good environmental policies. And societal attitudes, bye. God, that's important. I mean, when it all comes down to it, it's your values. What, how do you hold the environment? Where does it lay in your level of values? Is it more important for you to have a bigger, better house, you know, this and that? At some point, we have to, as a society, decide at what level we need to live, and it's enough because there's not enough resources to go around for everybody, including the wildlife. Um, so, um, but I didn't want to leave you totally depressed, um, so I thought I'd say something about what we're doing with education. Um, we've been doing education programs um, at Eva Luina for a long, long time, over 15 years. Um, we have a number of different programs, but one of the best is the Saturday schools. Basically, that was the parents coming up to us saying, our kids aren't passing from primary to secondary school. Can you help us? We need tutoring. So the Saturday school started. We did tutoring in the basics so they can get through um, their test that will allow them to go to secondary school. And we got conservation messages in there. Well, um, very exciting. Uh, UNICEF that's developing a new program, so Connecting Classrooms, and this is a push to really have kids engage kids so that it's kids talking about conservation and kids talking about things that are important to them and learning from each other. Um, and they have established this program in four different um, areas in Madagascar, and we were selected as one of them. And so, I mean, this is a rural village, you know, I'm thinking, they don't have any access to computers or anything, but so they're learning how to use the keyboards and that, and then they have to come down, until one day we might have um, internet up there, they have to come down to Eva Luina and they can use our computers. And so starting to learn that, and eventually they would actually be able to communicate with people in different countries, which would be pretty cool. Um, one thing we're proud of is that UNICEF has chosen our Saturday school as a model and want to expand it to other parts of the island. Um, so there's four different groups that are working with UNICEF um, that they're going to move the Saturday school program into. And of course, as you um, move it along, you also improve on it and update it. Um, but this connecting classrooms also um, involves teen clubs, um, teens talking with each other, and also junior reporters, so um, kids learning how to interview. Um, so it's kind of a more inclusive program looking at different activities for the youth, and hopefully we also need the adults to do something, and pretty darn fast, but um, having the youth uh, grow up with hopefully um, greater interest and curiosity um, in the environment as well as other people. Maybe it'll move it along. So, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions? I was that good.
I live in the Shaw neighborhood. I'm just right from here. Um, yeah, uh, so I think, um, what's the lifespan of a lemur? Um, so in the wild, of course, it's a little bit more difficult. Some areas like Ranamathana have um, some identified animals that they can monitor over time. So some of them have gotten into the 20s, but um, so in captivity, it certainly is an issue. Um, our rough lemur, our oldest one, died at 34, and a black lemur at 32. Um, so, um, it's a commitment, <laughs> and yeah, they can have pretty long lifespans. Of course, the wild is harder. Do you have a question? Um, well, actually, um, I started working with the lemurs here at the zoo and got involved with the stud book, and so your path kind of goes in that direction. Started and I was the SSP coordinator for Rough Lamers and we were going to do a release, and so I got more and more involved. It's kind of funny how your path goes. I was going to do carnivores, but ended up with lemurs. Does the group own the land or do you lease it to the government? Or? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, uh, the government really likes us, and so we got one of these 99 year leases like the Koreans were trying to get. Um, so basically, um, Ibuina is ours to manage. Um, but of course, I mean, um, the way we approach it is what we do there. We're trying to fulfill needs of that community, so conservation needs and other needs of that community. So it's a it's a dialogue. Um, well, there's some problems with um, actually uh, right now nocturnal studies. So um, they have you know ended. They don't allow us to go out at night now. Um, so these are some of these weird rules that come in. Um, visas, um, you can get visas. I mean, we've got um, Lana just just went, and so it's a renewal process. Um, I think now visas last for six months and you have to renew it. You also need to get research permit, depending on where you're doing your research, if it's a protected area. Um, but one of the nice things about the MSG is that the students that we work with, we facilitate um, a lot of that. So it's really nice for them that we've got people in country that can help them through that process. Well, thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate it. And I love it.